ladies and gentlemen thank you for attending the event today first of all i would like to welcome you all to our eighth international cme on xyz on sex cord stromal tumor and secondary metastatic ovarian tumor a malignant ovarian tumor cancer patient 5 to 30% patient are diagnosed as metastatic ovarian cancer in clinical and histopathology report in fact misinterpretation of ovarian tumors can result significant adverse effect for the treatment so we focus this topic today the program will be chaired by professor a choudhry resident kanju oncology society of bangladesh and first president of ogsp and sapo with the permission of honorable chairperson of today's session we are going to start the program organized by gani oncology society of bangladesh and ogsp the program will be telecasted live in facebook i am requesting to share it now i am requesting uh, professor rokia anwar professor gani oncology department of national institute of cancer research hospital to give welcome speech thank you dr kashipa um, good evening everyone Assalamu alaikum and very good evening to you all. It is a great honor to have opportunity to welcome all of you to the eighth international CME on XYZ of sex cord stromal tumor and secondary metastatic ovarian tumor organized by GOSP and OGSP. I warmly welcome today's chairperson, my mentor, inspiration, uh, our guardian, Professor T. H. Udhuri sir. President of GOSB, past president of OGSB and SAFO. It is my privilege to welcome today's chief guest, our great guide teacher, Professor National Professor Shahla Khatun. She is my mentor also. Madam, welcome to you this webinar. I would like to welcome eminent panelist of this session, Professor Najma Hok, head of the department, Department of Gynecological Oncology, Dhaka Medical College Hospital. Professor Hosni Ara, Head of the Department of St. Gaini Department, Dhaka Central International Medical College and Hospital, Organizing Secretary of OGSB. Also, our, my colleague, Professor Shahana Parvin, she is also working with me as Professor of, Professor of the Department of Gynecological Oncology, National Institute of Cancer Research Hospital, Dhaka. Today, we have two eminent speakers with us Professor Abraham Pedicel, Senior Consultant, Sultan Kobas, Comprehensive Cancer Center, Muscat, Oman. Welcome you, sir, to our webinar, coming virtually. And another eminent person, Professor Syed Akram Hussain, Senior Consultant, Coordinator, Square Oncology and Radio Therapy Center. I cordially welcome the moderator of most exciting part of the, our webinar today, Professor Sabira Khatun. Secretary General GOSB and Founder Chairman of Gynecological Oncology Department, BSMMU. Madam is the initiator, coordinator, all that credit goes to Professor Sabra Khatun, Madam, to organize such high-tech webinar. I would like to welcome today's case presenter. They are our young star, young fellow. Two of them are Dr. Nazneen Choudhury, BSMMU, Dr. Gopa Kundu, BSMMU, and another two, Case presenter are Dr. Sirajum Munira, medical officer from National Cancer Institute and Hospital, and Dr. Raihana Fedros, National Cancer Institute and Hospital, Dhaka. Finally, I would like to welcome Dr. Kashepa Khatun, Associate Professor, uh, Department of Gynecological Oncology, National Cancer Institute and Hospital, and our audience to this CME session. Please be with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your valuable speech. Now I would like to request Professor Roshanara, Madam. Madam. Madam Kyachan. Kyachan, unmute with your Madam. 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 
দেখতে পাচ্ছ কি আমি দেখতে পাচ্ছি না ম্যাডাম আছেন ম্যাডাম কথা শোনা যাচ্ছে না Now I am requesting Professor Roshonara Begum, Madam, to give your opinion regarding to introductory speech for today's CME session. Thank you. Actually, I'm, I am in a, a chamber. Just I have finished my chamber. Whole day we were all were busy in the Parliamentary Society of Bangladesh. I just, just in your um, Zoom meeting, uh, I, I just welcome you, uh, those, those who are participating here, and I wish all the success of the same one. Thank you, everybody. Today, we are privileged to have two learned speakers from home and abroad. Our first speaker, our special guest, Professor Abraham Pedicelli, Senior Consultant, Gynae Oncology, Sultan Kabul Comprehensive Cancer Center, Maskat Owen, and he was first president past president of AGOI. We know sex code stromal tumors account for approximately 7% of all malignant ovarian neoplasm, and they are extreme reality. Make it difficult to understanding the nature, natural history of the disease pathology and prognosis. So I, uh, I request to deliver his presentation. I think your presentation enlightened us. Yeah. How much time do I have? You have 15 minute time, sir. Okay, I'll try to finish it in that time. Sorry, I think. Pardon me if I exceed by a few minutes. Okay, can I share my screen? Yes, sir. Yes, my slides are coming up. I would like to thank Professor Cartoon and all the other organizers for inviting me to give this talk. Let me make it full screen. Can you see my slides? No. Yes. Now we can see your slides. Yes. You can start now. So, sex cord stromal tumors are those composed of, you know, arising from the granulosa cells, theca cells, certainly cells, Leydig cells, fibroblasts of stromal origin, maybe singly or in various combinations. Now, there are so many ovarian tumors, so many different types of ovarian tumors, and it's very difficult to know exactly what tumor is going on unless we take them out. So unless we operate and send them for histopaths, very difficult. And uh, sometimes, you know, we do take a biopsy if you're not going to operate. But if you're going to operate, then we should not be doing uh, fine needle biopsies, but we should be actually doing a excision of the mass. Now, this is the relative proportions of tumors and surface epithelial tumors account for the majority then followed by germ cell tumors and sex cord stromal tumors are I, probably 10% is on the upper limit. Like was mentioned, maybe seven, maybe eight. So around that eight to ten percent is what is usually uh, mentioned. And uh, the benign sex cord stromal tumors, about one to four percent of all, form one to four percent of all the benign ovarian tumors. And if you look at malignant ovarian tumors, about five to eight percent of all malignant ovarian tumors are malignant sex cord stromal tumors. Again, just to show the various uh, types of ovarian cancers. And so we here today we are interested only in the, these ovarian sex cord stromal tumors. And you can see that there are so many of different types of them, fibromas, thecomas, fibrosarcomas, radic cell tumors, steroid cell tumor, and so on. And uh, of course, all these other tumors are, the epithelial tumors are much more common followed by the germ cell tumors. 
So if you look at uh, the origin, the sex cord stroma is from the, like I said, the cells in the stroma are also from the sex cords. That is mainly the granulosa cells and th theca cells. And 5 to 10% is how common they are of all the tumors. And the, all ages can be found with ovarian sex cord stromal tumors. As uh, when if you look at uh, germ cell tumors, they're usually in the younger age group. And uh, epithelial tumors are probably in the older age group, although we do see it in younger women as well. So really the sex cord stroma tumors depends on uh, which type of cell they come from. So the granular cells would give rise to the adult or juvenile type. Theca cells will give rise to the thecoma. Fibroblasts would give rise to fibroma or the malignant part, which is the fibrosarcoma. Sertaly cells give rise to sertaly cell tumor. Leydig cells give to Leydig cell tumor. But you could have mixed tumors as well. So the WHO classification of ovarian tumors, it is, uh, so the classification has changed. We do have the histo histological classification, but the WHO classification has grouped these tumors into three main groups. One, the pure stromal tumors, that is the fibroma, cellular fibroma, thecoma, luteinized thecoma with sclerosing peritonitis, sclerosing stromal tumor, signet ring stromal tumor, microcystic stromal tumor, Leydig cell tumor, steroid cell tumor, malignant steroid cell tumor, fibrosarcoma. The pure sex cord tumors, adult granulosa cell, juvenile granulosa cell tumor, certainly cell tumor, and the sex cord tumors with annular tubules. The third group is the mixed sex cord stromal tumors. So we have the sertaly cells and the Leydig cells. So certainly Leydig cell tumor, and these can be well differentiated, majority of them, but we can have moderately differentiated, poorly differentiated, and also retiform with heterologous elements. Even some of the poorly differentiated and moderately differentiated tumors can have heterologous elements which is uh, probably a more uh, sinister form of the tumor. And of course, we have sex cord stromal tumors not otherwise specified. Again, if you look at ovarian cancer, we have the main groups of the epithelial and the non-epithelial. And among the non-epithelial, you have the sex cord stromal tumors, which, and here we see the mutations that are associated with this. In granulosa cell, we have the Fox L2, and in the certainly Leydig cell tumor, we have the DICER1 mutation. Of course, all these other epithelial tumors have all these other mutations. And we have our molecular labs checking for a whole panel of uh, gene mutations. But for if sex cord stromal tumors, these are the two main mutations. This slide shows the uh, different subtypes, the incidence rates, the age group, where they are found, the syndrome that they are associated with. For example, adult granulosa cell tumor is associated with the putz jeggers syndrome and the Potter syndrome. The prognosis is relatively poor. And like I said, it is associated with the FOXL2 mutation and also the TERT mutation, AKT1 amplification in 60%. The juvenile granulosa cell tumor, uh, actually, I think the adult granulosa cell tumor, this has got switched has got a better prognosis, whereas a juvenile granulosis tumor has a poorer prognosis. So, it's, sorry for that. Um, okay. turn it. And the certainly cell tumor, also associated with the putz jeggers syndrome, has got a relatively good prognosis. The sex cord tumor with annular tubules, also associated with the putz jeggers syndrome. The mixed sex cord tumors, again, very rare, and associated with the DICER mutation. And again, the prognosis is fairly good. If you look at the stromal tumors, most of them have a good prognosis, except for the fibrosarcoma. And uh, again, they may be associated with the Meek syndrome in fibromas, Cushing syndrome in the steroid cell tumor, and uh, again, associated with this mutation. Now, the pathologist does have a tough time. So this is these slides, I just look at uh, you know, if there's a pure mesenchymal pattern, then the pathologist has to decide is there other bland spindle cells, uh, looking at the story form pattern, variable collagen edema, then they say it's a fibroma. But if this is not very clear, 
and if there's more cytoplasm, lipid rich with calcification, fibrous plaques, then it's more likely to be a thecoma. And the combination of this, if it's ambiguous, is a fibrothecoma. If it's a very cellular pattern, then you call it a cellular fibroma without ATPA or a fibrosarcoma if there's ATPA and a lot of mitotic figures. Of course, they have to differentiate these from endometrial stromal sarcoma, and they may use the, you know, both the presence or absence of vessels and also the CD10, IHC, sclerosing stromal tumors, which may be lobulated, vacuolated cells, and so on. And in pathecomas have to be differentiated from granulosa cell tumors, diffuse pattern, leomyomas, gastrointestinal stromal tumor, that is a gist where the C-kit is positive. The cellular fibromas have to be differentiated from the endometrial stromal sarcoma, diffuse granulosa cell tumor, and so on. So sarcomatoid, certainly Leydig cell tumor, and rare sarcomas. Other pure stromal tumors, if it's a prominent vacuolated or signet ring cells are present, then it could be a sclerosing stromal tumor, or a primary signet ring stromal tumor, or if a tubular pattern with cytoplasmic lipid, it's a certainly cell tumor, which is lipid rich. Again, we have to exclude the Krukenberg tumor, which has a lot of mucin, which is a secondary metastatic tumor. Mixed sex cord stromal tumors, it could be epithelial and stromal, usually well differentiated. If there are hollow solid tubules, bland nuclei, luteinization, plus or minus oxyphilic cytoplasm, inhibin plus, and so on. Um, you know, it could be certainly cell tumors or well differentiated, certainly Leydig cell tumors, and they have to exclude endometroid carcinomas, which are EMA positive, tubular Krukenberg tumors, which are mucin positive, trabecular struma ovari, which is thyroglobulin positive, and so on. If there are prominent steroid or luteinized cells, then you know these they have to differentiate from all these. So the pathologist has a tough time. It's not easy to differentiate all these tumors. So as a group, these uh, are usually occur around 50, but the range range can be you know as low as in the teenage years to the postmenopausal age groups, even at 78 years. And most of the time they are postmenopausal. Almost 30% of them present with irregular bleeding. Uh, 8 to 10% may have virilization or masculinization or defeminization. And abnormal CA-185 may be seen in a very small percentage, probably if there's some peritoneal involvement. And most of these patients present with pain, abdomen, pressure, feeling of pressure, bloating, constipation, pass, increased frequency of urination. Uh, if there are functioning tumors then, that produce hormones, and these may cause menstrual irregularities or you know, postmenopausal vaginal bleeding. Uh, granulosa cell tumors may be one cause of a postmenopausal bleeding, or it could have breast tenderness or changes in the breast. And in the very early teenage years, they could pre pre present with uh, precocious puberty. On examination, you see that there may be a mass arising with the pelvis or you. On PV examination, there's an adnexal mass, and usually not very big, two to eight centimeters only. And the mass is usually firm, mobile, and they may present, like I said, with precocious puberty, breast tenderness, and so on. So the diagnostic workup would be all these tumor markers, depending on the age group. The younger patients, we would ask for all the germ cell markers, and also we sometimes have to ask for the inhibin B or anti-mullerian hormone. These are uh, high in the granulosa cell tumors. CA-185 also may be sent in the older group because we really don't know what we are dealing with. Now, imaging plays a big role, ultrasound, CT scan. Um, and of course, if we are operating, then we would do the complete blood count, LFT, renal function tests, and so on. If you are suspecting a gonadoblastoma, then we should do a karyotype. Now, ultrasound has the advantage of non-radiation and should be the first modality of imaging. And as gynecologists, we all have good access to ultrasound. And it's always good to see the picture for ourselves before we operate and not just depend on the radiologist. And the quality of ultrasound, high, there's high resolution ultrasound has improved over the years. And only the problem is these echoes of the sex cord stromal tumors are similar to normal ovarian tissue. 
And sometimes, uh, you know, the isoequic and hypoequic solid masses with or without obvious blood flow signals. So some, it's not very easy to make out uh, exactly what tumor it is, but uh, we can identify these adnexal masses on ultrasound. And this is sort of an example of, uh, you know, what sort of images you look look like, like certainly Leydig cell tumor mainly mm -hmm. looks fairly solid with a few cystic spaces. There may be some color flow on Doppler. This is an ovarian fibroma. If you do CT scan or MRI, again showing coronal delayed contrast enhanced CT image, a well-defined homogeneous right ovarian mass, isodense to the uterus, very sparse contrast uptake. And here we have uh, the T2 weighted and T1 weighted images showing a uh, little bit of fluid in the pouch of Douglas behind the uterus. Again, very difficult to make out exactly what type of tumor it is, but we'll have to take a educated guess. So what are the radi radiological characteristics? I mean, fibromas present as solid, hypoequic, homogeneously isodense masses with characteristic hypointensity on T1 images, strong hypointensity on T2 images, and delayed enhancement after contrast. T comas and granulosa cell tumors are associated with hyperestrogenic states that induce endometrial hyperplasia and carcinoma. So a very thick endometrium would suggest that this is a functional uh, sex cord stroman tumor. Steroid cell tumors, Leydig tumors, and steroid Leydig, certainly Leydig cell tumors are usually small tumors, maybe three, four centimeters in size, difficult to depict, but we need to look at the morphological changes within the ovary, especially on MRI and transvagin ultrasound with color Doppler, and uh, to differentiate from the normal ovarian tissue. And these uh, usually manifest as unilateral tumors comprising of star-shaped hypoechoic areas and close by solid areas. On MRI, the pseudo-lobular solid areas exhibit a spoke wheel pattern, display iso to hypointensity on T2-weighted images with early and avid contrast uptake. Immunostains, tumor markers are, of course, used by the pathologists. So, for example, CD99, CD56, all are used. Uh, Vimentin, all have been used, but indimid and calretinin have proven to be the most helpful to date. And of course, uh, not in all the stromal tumors, but in some of them. And uh, these stains are additional markers that may be useful, but these are, you know, chromogranin may be, these are to rule out other types of tumors, epithelial or, um, you know, neuroendocrine and so on. Now, looking at granulosa cell tumors, there are two main types, adult and the juvenile type. And uh, the age group is uh, below 20, usually in the juvenile group, whereas the adult group is around 50, the 50s. And uh, they present with perimenopausal or postmenopausal bleeding and the pelvic mass. Here, they present with isosexual precocity, precociousness. Histological patterns are quite different. Uh, here you have the characteristic coffee bean appearance. Here we have the pseudo papillary pattern. And uh, mitosis are quite frequent in the juvenile type. ATP is present here. Collection of bodies are found in the adult type. They are very rare in the juvenile type. Deutinization is common in the. So these, these are the differences that are used. And of course, the mutations are also different. The certainly leading cell, they. They look like the cells found in the testis, but these, uh, you know, you have the RNK crystals, which are rod-shaped intracellular, intracytoplasmic bodies within these cells. And because of the testosterone production, they give rise to masculine features, hirsutism, and so on. And the certainly Leydig cell tumor is some, looks something like this, on gross as well as on histology. And uh, they form less than 0.2% of all ovarian tumors. They're usually unilateral. They found in 15 to 25 year age group. They secrete testosterone. And usually these tumors are well differentiated and present in the early stage. But relapse is more common if they are poorly differentiated or they have heterologous elements. Staging is as with the epithelial tumors. The same staging uh, is used. 
So I won't go into the details, but it's just to show you that it's the same staging that is used. Luckily, most of these tumors present in stage one or stage two. Now, this is the NCCN guideline for the management of ovarian sex cord stromal tumors. So if it is early stage, 1A, stage 1, and if there's a young patient, fertility is desired, then definitely we can do fertility sparing surgery. Just a salping oophorectomy, we can, we need not even do the lymph node dissection. And if it is uh, comes out as stage 1, low risk, they can just be observed. There's no need for any adjuvant treatment. If it is a stage one, but there are some high risk features like rupture during surgery, or if this poorly differentiated, or if there are heterologous elements that makes it intermediate risk, then either we can observe or we can consider chemotherapy, platinum based, and uh, either BEP or even carboplatin taxol. If it is a more advanced stage, then definitely we need to. Uh, we do need to do the complete staging, but here again, we can omit uh, the lymph nodes because uh, it's not very common to spread there. And uh, the only problem is we do not know beforehand what the histology is. So as a practice, maybe it is better to do the stay full staging unless we have got very good frozen section and we can find out exactly what the tumor is. Sometimes we are not sure. So maybe it's better to do the full staging. And uh, after the final diagnosis is made, we discuss all this in the multidisciplinary team meeting and we give them chemotherapy. Uh, or for limited disease, there is a very small role for radiation therapy. And if there is a recurrence, we could uh, put them in a trial or consider secondary cytoreductive surgery or even repeat the chemotherapy. So the chemotherapy, like I said, is either paclitaxel carboplatin or bleomycin etoplicide cisplatin. Recurrences are treated with, again, docetaxel, any of these uh, regimens. And if it's isolated recurrence, like I said, we can even uh, do secondary surgery or even give radiation therapy. Now, this is some of the toxicities due to the BEP regimen. Uh, more of the medical oncologists would, you know, those who are giving chemotherapy would be familiar with these uh, problems. For lack of time, I will keep going. So follow-up of these patients, the clinical examination every three months for two years, then every six months for the next three years, tumor markers for functional tumors every six months. There's insufficient data to support routine imaging, but if any problem is suspected, then of course we would do a CT scan or an MRI scan, but uh, maybe at least once a year, we should do a chest X-ray, abdomen, pelvis, CT scan with contrast, if, especially if recurrence is suspected. Now the prognosis, these tumors are relatively indolent and have a good prognosis with long-term survival. So if you stage, take stage one and two, it's five-year survival is almost 95%. Stage three and four, it drops to about 60%. And again, if you look at age, uh, younger patients have a better survival, whereas older patients have a poorer survival. And uh, if you take both age and stage together, Age less than 50, stage 1 and 2 have a 5-year survival is almost 97%. In multivariate analysis, these stage and age are independent prognostic factors. So I'll stop here. And if there are any questions, I would be happy to take. Thank you. This is the cancer Thank center working. And this is uh, Muscat, the Matra. Beautiful. Thank, Thank you, you sir. Thank, Thank you, so you for your informative presentation. Our second speaker, Professor Shahid, Shahid Akram Hussain, Senior Consultant and Coordinator, Square Oncology and Radiotherapy Center. It is very difficult to differentiate primary ovarian cancer from metastatic tumors in the ovary. He will be sharing with us his expert opinion regarding metastatic ovarian cancer. I would like to welcome to deliver the presentation. Okay, thank you. Yes, uh, thank you so much. Uh, so I'll just to share my share. One second, give me a time to share. Can you able to see? 
specify? No, your, your slide is not visible, sir. Okay, thank you. It's supposed to be Oh, share the screen, okay. Yet not, huh? No, sir. Okay, thank you. Now you, you can able to see me, Shifa? Yes. Yes? Your site is visible. Oh, okay, thank you so much. So uh, I try to make a presentation for secondary, secondary metastatic ovarian tumor. So try to X, Y, Z means actually so many things. Uh, but I try to talk on these issues. But we have already uh, listened to a very prominent and respected person, Professor Abraham. So what is the properties represent common sites of the metastatic disease from other primary sites? Secondary tumor of the ovary account for the 10 to 25% of all ovarian malignancies. More common in premenopausal as compared with the postmenopausal event. And ovarian sings so the most primary common primary side actually for the colorectal 15 to 32 percent to 20 percent the gastric 6 to 22 percent appendix 2 to 20 percent and cervix 0.6 to 1.5 percent rarely lymphoma or sarcomas may metastasize to the ovary and present as ovarian masses so we know that actually 1896, the German gynecologist and the pathologist Frederick Ernest Krukenberg described the new kind of primary ovarian cancer, which he named as the fibrosarcoma ovary bicocellulary carcinomatodes. The metastatic nature of this tumor was revealed five years later by the Krauss, and who was probably the first to use the eponym Krukenberg tumor. Krukenberg tumor a secondary Ovarian tumors, histopathologically defined as carcinomas that have a significant component, more than 10% of the tumor of mucin filled signet ring cells. The most common origin of KT, uh, the Krukenberg tumor, is from the gastric, it's almost 70% of cases, and especially the poorly cohesive signet ring cell type. Even though uh, Krukenberg tumor are the, probably the best known secondary tumors of the ovary. The, they account for only about 30 to 40 percent of all secondary ovarian tumors. Incident depends on the multiple factors such as the geographic distribution, age of the patient, laboratory methods used in the diagnosis, experience of the pathologist examining the samples. Asian countries uh, have been consistently reporting the high rates of STOs compared to the European countries, which can be explained by a higher prevalence of the tumors metastasizing to ovaries in this region. Gastric cancer account for 23.4 to 30.4% of STOs in Japan and Korea, respectively, while only 4.5% in the Netherlands. Breast cancer and colorectal cancer, the most common primary tumors metastasizing, metastasizing to ovaries in Europe and USA. The age of diagnosis of STUs associated with the origin of the primary tumor. Patients with primary tumors localized within the GIT are generally older than those with the primary tumor localized outside the GIT. Patients with the breast cancer metastasizing to ovaries are significantly younger than those with primary tumors located elsewhere than the breast. Patients with STUs are generally younger than those with the primary epithelial ovarian tumor. Patients with the KT represent the youngest subgroup with an average age of 45 years at the time of diagnosis. 
the younger days of the STO diagnosis can be attributed to the fact that primary tumors metastasizing to ovaries arise at younger days than primary ovarian tumors. Greater ovarian vascularization in young women facilitates hematogenesis spread. STOs have a poor, generally poor prognosis, and as it usually represents an advanced stage of the disease, the survival is significantly worse than those with primary ovarian cancer. Five year overall survival 18.5 versus 40 percent. There are differences in the prognosis depending on the primary tumor. STOs originating from the genital tract is significantly better than outside the genital tract. Whereas STOs originating from pancreatic and small intestine cancer have the poor prognosis. Several prognostic factors have been identified preoperative CA125 level in the sedum, age of diagnosis, preoperative STO size, primary tumor origin, presence of peritoneal dissemination, extent of cytoreductive surgery, unilateral versus the bilaterality. So, CAP. Cap KM survival, the Kaplan mere survival curve showing the effect of the extent of metastatic disease on the patients with the crooken by tumor of colorectal cancer uh, origin, M ovary the ovary only ovary only metastasis, and M1 metastasis confined to the pelvis and the metastasis to the beyond the pelvis. So only one side actually more better in prognostically. That Okay. So pathogenic, the exact mechanism remain unclear and the several mechanisms have been proposed, including lymphogenous, hematogenous, transcelomic pathways. Hematogenous spread seems to be the most frequent pathway in colon cancer and other gynecological cancers. Retrograde, Lymphogenous spread seems to be involved in gastric cancer metastasis. Rich mucosal and submucosal lymphatic plexus in the stomach enables lymphogenous metastasis even at early stage of the disease. Tumor infiltration of the retroperitoneal lymphatic nodes by GA cancers may lead to lymphatic vessel obstruction and subsequently counter current of the lymph flow into the ovaries. Transcelomic dissemination, which is the main pathway of the metastasis in primary ovarian cancer, does not seem to play a major role in STO development. Majority of the patients, 70% pre present with the non-specific symptoms such as abdominal pain, postmenopausal bleeding, increasing abdominal guard, weight loss, Vaginal bleeding and the changes in the menstrual habits can be contributed. Ascites is present in the 39% of the cases of the diagnosis, the less common than primary ovarian cancer. Patients with STOs that originate from the appendix may present a pseudo eczema peritone. Generally, there are no clear differences between the symptoms arising from primary and the secondary ovarian malignancies. Making the correct diagnosis is the most challenging step in the management of STOs as they frequently mimic primary ovarian cancer. The diagnostic, diagnostic process should comprise through physical evolution, basic blood and biochemical analysis, imaging methods, and endoscopy. The only reliable method to distinguish STUs from the primary ovarian tumors comes through histopathological examination, preferably utilizing the immunohistory chemistry. Unfortunately, despite through diagnostic evolution, the primary tumor remains unknown in about 15% cases. So there are some imaging methods we're using for the CT scan, the abdomen and pelvis with the use of the intravenous contrast material should be performed as the baseline evolution as this is considered the standard of cancer care as an unknown primary site. No, none of the routinely used imaging methods, CT, ultrasonio, magnetic resonance imaging has proved reliable in distinguishing primary ovarian cancer from STOs. Primary ovarian tumors tend to be the multilocular, multilocular more frequently than STOs on ultrasonio and MR images. So the 
This is a picture you can see here the ovarian metastasis from the gastric cancer showing the gastric tumor, the left ovarian mass arrow. There is the gastric cancer, there is, and there is the ovarian. So you see the ovarian malignancy metastasis. So imagine actual ovarian metastasis from the colonic adenocarcinoma in a 29 year old woman, the actual CCT contrast and CT scan, the image of the abdomen and the pelvis demonstrate the left multiocular cystic tumor. So we can see here actually this is a cystic tumor uh, with the diffuse infiltration to the omentum, momentum diffuse infiltration to the omentum. So this is a diffuse infiltration and the nodular thickening of the small intestinal mesentery representing omentum and the mesenteric impacts. So what in metastasis from the rectal signatory in carcinoma in a 21 year old pregnant woman uh, T2 weighted MA, MR images demonstrate the bilateral multisectic cystic ovarian masses. Here is actually the multisystic ovarian masses. This is the one is actually. So with a large amount of ascites, you will see kind of where there is ascites also. And with segmental thickening of the rectum with narrowing of the lumen. So here is actually this one. So T2 image demonstrate the hyperintense cervical mass with the endoluminal extension into the endometrial, endometrial cavity. And the coronal T2, T2, D, T2 W demonstrate the complex mass arising from the both adenix and ascites. And the post contrast fat set, uh, set to the T1W actual images show the bilateral adenic cell complex lesion with the enhancement of the solid components. Imaging method actually the PET CT is not reliable, distinguishing for STOs from the primary ovarian tumors. And despite the superior sensitivity of PET CT over CT, there are several limitations, including the inability to detect the smaller lesion less than 1 pm, tumors with the low or no FDZ uptake, such as renal carcinoma, breast carcinoma, and some GI cancers. Per CT does not present a clear diagnostic advantage over the CT alone in patients with multiple metastases of an unknown primary site. Therefore, the per CT cannot be recommended as a routine imaging method in the patient of the STOs. Potential false positive include the physiological uptake of FDZ by the endometrium and ovaries in the premenopausal patients. Patients FDZ activity in benign conditions such as the uterine fibroids, pelvic inflammatory diseases, and the benign endometriotic cyst. Potential false negative include the low level of the FDZ uptake by necrotic, mucinous, cystic, or low grade tumors. The physiology and retail optic in a 34-year-old premenopausal women during the menstrual flow phase of the harmenstrual harm cycle. So the post-endometrial cancer in a 64-year-old postmenopausal women under the investigation for a solitary primary, solitary uh, pulmonary nodule. So sagittal fuse actually, this is actually so many problem actually, sagittal fuse, FDG, FD, demonstrate the incidental focal uptake in the endometrium, subsequent Pathological analysis after the biopsy allowed confirmation of the cancer. So, SCT is not really reliable for unknown primary. Pathological FDZ uptake uh, in the 60 year old women with the primary sickle uh, carcinoma for a Krukenba tumor and actual fuse FDZ PSCT showed increased FDZ uptake in the both ovaries and the primary sickle adenoid carcinoma. The actual post contrast T1 weighted fat saturated MRI image demonstrated enhancing the ovarian lesions. Histologic analysis of the adenexal lesions confirm metastatic lesion from the sickle primary site. So endometrial or the primary FDs, ovarian FDZ activity in the postmenopausal women should be regarded as suspicious. Further correlation with the clinical history and the transvaginal ultrasound and the MRI imaging should be performed to exclude the malignancy. It is always important to correlate cystic and mucinous lesion at ultrasound and or MRI imaging as they are potentially false negative with FDZ opacity. FDZ uptake in peritoneal carcinomatosis can be masked by tracer activity within the bowel. The role of C125 and the other tumor markers, elevated C125 can be found in uh, 
80% of the women with the primary epithelial ovarian cancer and 70% those with the STOs. Sensitivity of CA125 in detecting STOs is significantly lower than in primary ovarian cancer. CA125 does not seem a useful biomarker in the primary diagnosis of STOs. So there is an important issues for the CA125 and the CA ratio, how they might be the clinically used in the distinguishing the primary ovarian tumor from the colorectal metastasis. Elevated preoperative CA125 and CA19.9 levels might be associated with an adverse prognosis. The use of other tumor markers in the diagnostic process is limited owing to their non-specificity. Routine use of the epith epithelial tumor markers in the primary diagnosis of STOs is not recommended. Tumor markers may provide useful information regarding the treatment response. So we can use the endoscopic methods actually recommended as the specific symptom imaging and the pathological abnormalities. But in general, the routine use of endoscopic method is not generally recommended. Considering that the majority of STUs are of GA origin, endoscopic investigation seems to be a reasonable approach, particularly in our country, or Asia, or subcontinent. It also provides a non-invasive method to obtain a histopathological specimen. Countries with a high incidence of the gastric and colorectal cancer endoscopic evaluation should always be considered as a frontline diagnostic tool in STOs of unknown primary site, unless the histopathological investigation rules out a possible GA origin. So the gross features favoring the metastasis include the small uh, size, less than 10 to 12 centimeter, bilateralism up to the 70%, not the growth pattern and the presence of a tumor on the surface or in the superficial cortex of the ovary. This is uh, a gross uh, morphology, bilateral metastasis of the gastric cancer to the ovary with characteristic kidney-shaped tumor, Krupenberg, small ovary with a characteristic nodular surface due to the breast, cross-section of the large metastatic colon cancer with the multicystic mucinous surface. So microscopic features, mucinous adenocarcinoma, the benign, the most common histopathological finding. Poorly, cohesive and the signaling cell morphology can be observed in the vast majority of metastasis from the gastric cancer. Breast cancer message to over is an invasive ductal and the lobular carcinoma. Metastatic endometrial malignancy are mainly the adenocarcinoma. Squamous cell carcinoma are the most common histological type of cervical metastasis. Other rare histopathological types include metastatic sarcoma, melanoma, and the lung cancer. So the, in general, the histopathological features including the metastasis include the infiltrative growth pattern with stromal desmoplasia and nodular growth pattern with the involvement of the ovary and surface in the superficial cortex, lymphovascular space involvement. So immunohistochemistry helps distinguish the primary and carcinoma from the STOs and ISAB evolution should always be employed, especially for the cytokeratin 7 and 20, are the most commonly determined antigen in ovarian tumors. Primary ovarian carcinoma are almost always CK7 positive in 90 to 100% where the immune reactivity to CK20 is generally negative. Other frequently used markers, including WT1, C125, which are associated with the primary ovarian cancer. So this is important, actually, I, I, immune psychometry finding of the metastatic ovarian tumor, particularly for the GI, CK20 plus positive, and CE positive, and CK7 is negative. So you can find here actually looking for the primary, so CK7 positive in case of, but here is not CK positive, CK metastatic carcinoma, CK7 uh, not positive in case of colorectal and appendix, especially the one variable case of the cuneary stroma cancer and the pancreas, you can find CK1. So this is on the variability, but not always positive. So the question is actually the molecular analysis and its role in the diagnosis of STOs. The molecular profiling may aid differential diagnosis between the ovarian primary tumor and the STOs. So in case of an in, inconclusive immunosecurity, uh, comprehensive the genomic analysis, a single nucleotide polymorphism, SNPSA, and transcriptomic analysis is used to distinguish the primary ovarian tumor from metastasis. Mutations of the S uh, uh, family number number four and the lysine methyl transferase to D genes that are associated with the reduced ovarian overall survival in ovarian metastasis from CRC. 
So mutation, there is new many mutation could be get keras, beta, p15, etc. etc. So what will be the treatment? The management of the STO should be based on the two diagnostic process to assess the primary tumor site, the biological characters, and the of the disease. If the tumor is the role of cytoreductive surgery, the decision of whether to perform the cytoreductive surgery must be made individual for each patient. The primary tumor site seems to be the most relevant factor when considering this approach. Patients with the disease uh, confined to the pelvis have better prognosis than other than those extra pelvic metastasis. Optimal cytoreduction may result in the higher five year survival rate. The extent of the cytoreduction surgery is an important prognostic factor. So, there is a group of people, patients who have benefited from the cytoreduction surgery. The good performance states metastasis limited to the ovaries, primary tumor of colorectal origin, and feasibility of no or minimal residual disease. Cytoreductive surgery and hypothermic interperitoneal HIPEC has become a potentially curative treatment for intra-abdominal metastasis from the colorectal malignancies. Patients with the gastrointestinal malignancies, some surgeons even recommend prophylactic ophorectomy during cytoreduction for peritoneal carcinomatosis owing to high risk of the ovarian metastasis. So here actually there are Kaplan Mayer survival curves showing the effect of the cytoreduction reduction on the patient with the crucian by tumors from the colorectal. Uh, so cytoreduction reduction actually giving the more survival, we can see here the more survival. So does not who did not go metastectomy, the survival benefit is, is that this is, metastasis is good, no mistake not good. So R0 resection is fantastic and better. Negative resection means the R0 resection is always good. If the resection in the R1 is not good. Survival according to the residual, less than 2 cm or more than 2 cm. This is also important. Actually, for the median survival time was 25 months for patients, those of largest residual lesion less than 2 cm. 14 months are for those who largest residual was more than or equal to 2 cm. So adjuvant chemotherapy, CT following by saturated surgery is able to prolong survival. Significant difference was seen in the survival between the patients who received adjuvant chemotherapy versus no chemotherapy with an estimated medial survival for 24 months and eight months. So platinum-based chemotherapy regimes seem to provide overall, provide a survival benefit in gastric and gastric gynecological primary, 5-FU and liquid with oxaliprotein in colorectal and appear to be improved the over clinical outcome. kaplan Mia survival curve showing the effect of systemic chemotherapy on patients of the crook and bud tumor of colorectal cancer. Systemic therapy is helpful more. So hyperthermic interperitoneal chemotherapy, we know that actually the increasing the penetration of the chemotherapy at the peritoneal surface and increase the sensitivity of cancer to chemotherapy by impairing the DNA requirement. So this is really important, interperitoneal chemotherapy during surgery delivered under the hypothermic conditions. So HIPEC overall giving the overall survival and you giving the more recurrence free survival time. So another one new modality is coming up. They pressurize the interperitoneal aerosol chemotherapy, PIPEC. PIPEC is a novel approach to efficiently deliver the chemotherapy in as in directly to the peritoneum in the form aerosol. Thus reduce the systemic side effect of the patient for the patient and potentially increase the cytotoxic efficacy. It showed the objective risk tumor response rate in 69% and the mean overall survival duration is 13.7 months. So here is actually many uh, regimens for the preferred regimen, Pacli, Carbo, Gemcitabin, Cisplatin, Capox, M, M, Folfox, Folfree, and other recommended, Docet Excel, et cetera, the Gem, gem uh, Dossi, Dossi, Cisplatin, Irontic and Carbonate, so many things, useful also some uh, uh, Prembrusimab and et cetera. So even sometimes you can also use the Bivasuzimab. The question of the role of the radiotherapy, there are the roles of radiotherapy on the metastatic setting to treat the local metastatic disease for the symptom palliation. 
nowadays that the people try in the past whole abdomen radiotherapy was used to but nowadays it's being replaced by more conformal radiotherapy i am actually on sbrt the conformal radiotherapy allows for the longer chemotherapy free intervals and should be considered as a part of the treatment paradigm paradigm for the salvis therapy of isolated lesions it is one of the newer options for palliative or the salvis radiotherapy that allows for the focus high dose radio radiation to the tumor with minimal dose to organs in close proximity and is ideal for the residual or the limited metastatic disease this is here too we can see the 5 to 2 5 to fractions so another new question apps called it for immunotherapy term apscopal was originally used in 1953 to describe the systemic effects of radiation apscopal effect radiation therapy physically works through the release of the tumor and tissue and while radiation exerts dna damage to the tumor site systemic secretion of the specific cytokines and chemokines triggers the systemic immune response against the local tumor and tissue several proof of principle trials are ongoing to determine whether the apscopal effect can be augmented by the demonstrating radiation therapy in conjunction with the immune activating agent for the ovarian malignancy so there's actually many one actually check point block it we can use and how can we use and particularly for ctl4 ctl4 and the ntpd1 and pdl1 antibodies so there's vrt so pembrolizumab that's the questions of using pembrolizumab the chemo radiation therapy so the take home message is the metastasis to ovaries from the various primary tumor site is not a rare event secondary tumors of the ovaries may resemble primary ovarian cancer especially in the case of the mucinous adenocarcinoma immunohistochemistry plays a major role in distinguishing primary from the secondary ovarian tumors and may suggest the potential primary tumor site the prognosis of these tumors is generally dismal although there are differences among distinct histopathological subtypes treatment is always individualized cytoreactive surgery may provide a survivable benefit in select subgroups of patients adjuvant chemotherapy seemingly provides survival benefit interperitoneal ct chemotherapy high pack pipe pack with surgery showing good response and increased survival conformal radiotherapy or sbrt hysterectomy body radiotherapy should be considered as a part of the treatment paradigm for salvage therapy of isolated metastatic lesion or in palliative setting immunotherapy has rapidly developed and has revolutionized the treatment of the metastatic cancers thank you thank you so much thank you thank you thank you for your informative presentation now we like to move forward to our second event guest presentation and question and answer session I would like to welcome Professor Sabeda Khatu, Secretary General, Gandhi Oncology Society of Bangladesh, to moderate this event. We are lucky to have three expert panelists. Now I would like to request Dr. Nalpin Choudhury to present her case. Assalamu alaikum, madam. Can you hear me? Okay. Your slide is visible. You are audible. Please Thank show you. slide show. Slide show. Yeah. <clears throat> Respected chairperson, distinguished faculties from home and abroad, and learned audience. Assalamu alaikum and very good evening. I am here, Dr. Nasim Choudhury, and a heartiest welcome you all to today's case presentation session. My case, Mrs. Kushida Begum, 75 years of age, mother of four living children. Slide change, Karan. Slide change. Mrs. Kushida Begum, 75 years of age. Uh, mother of four living children had four I spin of the Nagin, slide change. Your slide change is not moving. What's in Change your slide. 
পুরে দাও হুম পরে যাও দেখা যাচ্ছে ফ্লাইট দেখা যাচ্ছে ইউ ক্যান কন্টিনিউ জি ম্যাম কন্টিনিউ মিসেস খুশিদা বেগম She is the only wife of her husband and the couple practice no contraceptive during their conjugal life. On examination, um, she is, uh, her performance status is ECOG zero. She is mildly anemic. There is no, the thyroid gland is not enlarged and there is no lymphadenopathy and her vital parameters are within normal limit. Clinical based examination reveal nothing abnormality. On par abdominal examination, a solid mass is felt about 15 to 20 centimeter occupying right iliac hypogastriac region with extension to the umbilical and right lumbar region. The mass has well-defined regular margin. It is mobile and non-tender. Ascites was absent. On par speculum examination, cervix was broad and mild bloodstain discharge was coming out to the os. On bimanual examination, a solid mass about 15 to 20 centimeter is filled through right anterior and posterior furnaces, and it is separated from the uterus and mobile. It is not fixed with the underlying structure. Uterus was bulky in size. No deposit was filled in pouch of Douglas. Next. Ultrasound of whole abdomen and uh, with transvaginal sonography reveal endometrium is thickened and there is a complex right ovarian cyst. Thanks. Her common tumor markers like serum CO125 CN, uh, serum AFP was uh, within normal limit. She gave a history oh. of history of um, uh, FNSC at Khaja Yunus Ali Hospital, Shiraz Gunj. And histopathology of the report shows a germ cell tumor or granulosa cell tumor of ovary. Her fractional curatus was done on 8th October uh, 2021 at OGSB Hospital. Histopathology report shows atrophic change of endometrial tissue. She underwent laparotomy on 13th October 2021. And the operation consisting of total abdominal hysterectomy with right ovaryotomy and sulfingectomy 
Left-sided sulfing ophrectomy with bilateral pelvic lymph node dissection with omentectomy and multiple biopsy. This is the specimen um, after operation. Here the um, tumor is uh, partly solid and partly cystic and the capsule was intact. There was no tumor on the surface. And this is the first gynae cancer operation done in OGSB Hospital, Mipur. And it, the operation was done by a pioneer gynae oncologist of Bangladesh, Professor Sabera Khatun, Madam. She is our mentor and we are very fortunate uh, to uh, learn many things uh, from her. Next. This is the histopathology report of uh, the patient, which shows granulosa cell tumor and moderately differentiated. Patient. The, uh, there was no um, uh, there was no tumor deposit on peritoneal surface or omentum, but there are some few enlarged lymph nodes on both la um, lateral uh, pelvic wall, and the highest size was two point five centimeters. So, madam, review all the slide histopathology uh, skull examination, uh, and which also shows reactionary change of the tumor, reactionary change of the lymph node. So my final diagnosis was of uh, granulosa cell tumor of the ovary. Spinal stage was 1A. The patient was now on observation. Thank you, madam. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Nazneen Choudhury for your presentation of a very interesting case. Now we have the panelist with us in this case discussion session. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, we have the one of the senior most panelists in this panel, panel session, uh, Professor Begum Husniara. She is the professor and head of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology of uh, Dhaka Central International Medical College Hospital. And my question to uh, Professor Husniara, Begum Husniara, this is the case, this is the typical uh, presentation of granulosa cell tumor with postmenopausal bleeding. My question is, uh, as a general gynecologist, how frequently you find this type of case that is postmenopausal bleeding with granulosa cell tumor and whether fractional curities was justified in this case? What is your opinion? Thank you, Professor Sabera Mehta. This is a nice question for me. The honorable chairperson, chief guest and speakers from home and abroad, panelists and moderator and case presenters. Assalamu alaikum and good evening. My case scenario is postmenopausal bleeding with granulosa cell tumor that can be treated by total abdominal hysterectomy, bilateral sulfingophrectomy and bilateral pelvic lymph nonectomy and omental resection and histopathology report shows it is a case of stage 1A ovarian tumor with cystic hyperplasia of endometrium. Now, how frequently? The frequently, mainly the frequency frequency of postmenopausal bleeding with granulosa cell tumor is very rare condition. It is approximately 70% of 70% sex stromal tumor, but still it is a 2 to 5% of ovarian neoplasm. But the prognosis of this disease is good comparative to the other neoplasm. I have seen this case in my period till date about eight to 10, there, there are often a low grade malignancy and there is usually diagnosed in early stages and recurrence rate is high and need the long-term follow-up. My next question, whether the fractional curatives is justified or not. The postmenopausal bleeding with granulosa cell tumor Fractional cuties was justified because, but the, I think the hysteroscopy is the gold standard for diagnosis of evaluation of postmenopausal bleeding. Hysteroscopy directed biopsy is more justified than the fractional cuties, but the 
uh, hysteroscopy has some drawbacks. Like if there is a endometrial carcinoma, mm -hmm. it may be it may be spilling of endometrial carcinoma during the time of hysteroscopy. Hysteroscopy. So the granulosa cell tumor, the estrogen producing tumor, it may cause the cystic hyperplasia, a typical hyperplasia. So it is justified if the frictional cutis, but also gold standard, I think the hysteroscopy, gold standard, the patient can be for evaluation and for diagnosis and evaluation of endometrium. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much, Professor Begum Husniara Begum. Uh, Husniara, for your very critic, uh, criticism about the case and uh, uh, sharing experience about this type of presentation of the patient that is granulosal tumor with postmenopausal bleeding. Thank you very much. Uh, now the second case of our second case will be presented by uh, Dr. Second question, Shia Shia Shia. Shia. Second question. Actor, second question, I say. Second question, can you, what is the teaching for our junior fellow, fellows? Uh, thank you, madam, for my, the second you question. Have, you have given answer to this question. So you can discuss about the teaching for our junior fellows. The junior fellows must think about if the patient complain of postmenopausal bleeding with mass in the lower abdomen. She must think, rethink about the granulosa cell tumor cause the postmenopausal bleeding, though the lots of causes associated with the postmenopausal bleeding. My care about the junior fellows, so proper history examination already told, and investigation like ultrasonogram of whole abdomen, transvaginal sonogram, and colored doppler, and, and also the marker already told, the C125C. I think the, the marker that is the, that not be done in this case, the inhibin and estrogen level. I think the patient need the level of inhibin and estrogen. And also the, FNAC and hysteroscopy is important in this case for diagnosis of this tumor. But in this case, why also the I think may need the MRI or CT scan. Then the my junior fellow is she is a if she is a gynae oncology, she managed the case. I think she managed the case properly, but. If she is not an oncogynecologist, she should refer the case in oncogynecologist for proper management of the patient because of and also proper management of the patient and long-term follow-up the patient and prevention of carcinoma by follow-up. Thank you, madam. Thank you, uh, Professor Begum Husniara, for your very vivid discussion about this case and very uh, direct uh, opinion about the, our junior junior fellows. Thank you very much. Our second case will be presented by Dr. Shiajun Monira. Dr. Shiajun Monira. Assalamu alaikum, madam. Assalamu alaikum, madam. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Assalamu alaikum to all my respected teachers and learned audience. I'm Dr. Sirajun Munira from National Institute of Cancer Research and Hospital presenting the case. Now I'm sharing my screen. Is my uh, slide is uh, visible? No. You are visible, not your slide is not visible. Uh, yes. I give presentation to open for any share with that share. Open. Uh. <clears throat> okay. Presentation to open, 
প্রেজেন্টেশন মোডে দিতে হবে তারপর শেয়ার করতে হবে প্রেজেন্টেশন মোডে ওকে यस নাও ইউ আর ভিজিবল ইজ ইট ভিজিবল ম্যাডাম यस ইউ ক্যান কন্টিনিউ নাও यस आई एम डॉक्टर सिरंजू मुनिया नाउ प्रेजेंटिंग द केस here uh, our patient mrs taslin 40 years old mother of two children was reasonably well one and a half years back then she developed intermenstrual bleeding for two months and mild lower abdominal pain for one month with those complaints she attended shoit sarwardi medical college gaini outpatient door and diagnosed as a case of bilateral ovarian tumor at that time her tumor markers were slightly raised among them ca 99 was 140 unit per ml and ca 125 was 486 unit per ml here is her ultrasonogram scan at that time which revealed uterus was mildly enlarged and dense fluid collection was in uterine cavity in adnexa there was a large complex mass about 10 into 8 cm in size in left lower abdomen and in left adnexal region there was also another mass about 5 into 3 cm in left adnexa large cystic mass about 18 to 5 cm was also present in right adnexa there was also mild ascites with those reports she underwent total abdominal hysterectomy with bilateral sulfingo-oophorectomy with infracolic omentectomy on 20th August of 2020 by a local gynecologist at Mamin Singh without any cervical evaluation. Her histopathology report revealed malignancy. Here is those reports. Where histopathology report of uterus showed a cauliflower-like growth within the cervix and the variety of that growth was invasive squamous cell carcinoma grade one. And uterine wall showed invasion by the same tumor. The ovarian tumor showed metastatic squamous cell carcinoma grade one. And tissue from omentum revealed no malignancy. With those reports, the, patients, the patient was referred to Bangamundu Sheikh Mujib Medical University for further management. They reviewed the slide and also advised for immunohistochemistry. Here is the reviewed report, which, which revealed poorly differentiated carcinoma of cervix and uterine wall was also invaded by the same tumor, but they were confused about whether it was squamous or not. Here is the previous report, which revealed cervix squamous cell carcinoma grade one and ovary metastatic squamous cell carcinoma. Here is the immunohistochemistry report where the KI67 and P16 tumor cells were positive. Also, WT1 tumor cells Change were positive. Slide. Yes. Madam, here. Uh, proceed. Proceed. Slide. And the, and the interpretation was uh, it uh, the immunohistochemistry finding revealed it do not indicate squamous cell carcinoma, rather, indicates an ovarian serous carcinoma. With those reports, the patient referred to medical oncology department of BSMMU and they planned three weekly chemotherapy protocol with paclitaxel and cisplatin. But due to slight change, correct? change your slide. Madam, yes, slide ki change your slide. No, proceed. Proceed. Yeah, yeah. The, and uh, they uh, scheduled for paclitaxel and cisplatin. Next slide. Next slide. Yes. And 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 with uh, for the delayed schedule, they went to Asania Mission Cancer and General Hospital, and there she further evaluated by endoscopy, colonoscopy, and CT chest, which revealed no abnormality. At that situation, the uh, Asania Mission Cancer General Hospital started chemotherapy with paclitaxel, carboplatin, and bevacizumab. With that protocol, patient received ten cycles of chemotherapy from second October two thousand twenty up to. 3rd May 2021. Before starting chemotherapy, all the markers were normal except carcinoembryonic antigen, which was 840 nanogram per ml. Here, the patient underwent sev uh, several radiological imaging tools for follow-up at those times, and these are those. Unfortunately, the patient lost all his uh, imaging films. He had the MRI, which was done on 8, sep 8 September 2020, which revealed lobulated mass in right side of pelvis with invasion of adjacent vesical wall, extensive pelvic iliac and retroperitoneal lymphadenopathy, small lesions in the right lobe of liver. Another CT scan was done on 1st December 2020, which revealed 
post-operative status of TH with BLS at the same time, mild hepatosplenomegaly with ill-defined lobulated multi-enhancing lesion in the right side of the pelvis and at, uh, an attenuated lesion in subcapsular region of the right lobe of the liver, multiple enlarged lymph nodes. He had the PET CT scan of whole body of that patient, which was done on 10th February 2021. Here the report revealed no definite recurrent mass or abnormal FDG uptake at pelvic cavity, but small area of omental thickening, no ascites, but mild hepatomegaly with, without any focal lesion. After 10th chemo, multidisciplinary tumor board were held on 9th June 2021 at Ahsania Mission Cancer Hospital. Well, they concluded with monthly follow-up along with changed chemotherapy protocol with gemcitabine, carboplatin, and bevacizumab. But after introducing gemcitabine, patient developed pancytopenia, and that was corrected by one bag blood and nine bag, one bag platelet and nine bags of whole blood. As her carcinoembryonic antigen was still raised, they further planned for her maintenance chemotherapy with bevacizumab and oral nirapari 100 milligram three tablet per day for 14 days. At those conditions, along with those situations, patient came to us at NICRH on 27th November with no complaints except biochemical rising of carcinoembryonic antigen. And on examination, we found no abnormality. Here is her tumor markers regarding uh, during the whole chemotherapy period. Our multidisciplinary tumor board at NICRH held on 1st December 2021 and they concluded with further PET CT scan of whole body along with close follow-up. Here is our patient, Mrs. Taslin, who is seeking our kind prayers with an appropriate further management protocol. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Munira, uh, for your nice, very, Shiajun Munira, for your very interesting case presentation. Thank you, Madam. Uh, Professor Abraham, uh, do you want to say something about this case? Okay. So about this uh, about this case, uh, uh, first of all, I want to ask uh, some question uh, uh, about this case to Professor Sud Akram Hussain. He is a very renowned uh, renowned radiation oncologist in our country. So. Uh, my first question to Professor Soyed Akram Hussain. Uh, this patient developed uh, pancytopenia during chemotherapy. Uh, whether this uh, can could be avoided because pancytopenia is a very serious condition for the patient and that may cause death of the patient. So whether this pancytopenia could be avoided during treatment. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, madam. Uh, definitely, this is a very interesting case. Patient in different places, diagnosis and different dilemmas and diagnostic dilemmas. And finally, patient received treatment in, in hospital in Bangladesh. So in generally, when a patient getting so much chemotherapy uh, in any patient, patient received multiple as in chemotherapy. And in general, the bone marrow result and other issues is always an important. And particularly for a long time, if you give chemotherapy, whatever it may be, it always may cause difficulties. But how can we overcome this situation? It's possible. If we use, I don't know exactly, there is no information whether they use the colony spreading factor after chemotherapy. Uh, I don't know. There is any, uh, maybe Dr. Shiraj Munira may know. There is uh, the patient uh, use. As for patient told us, uh, told us they also give the colony stimulating factor along with those one bag of uh, platelet and nine bags of uh, uh, whole blood. It is the one actually. But in, in general, when it's requirement, if in the requirement, if you every time when you give chemotherapy, you have to analyze the blood reports regularly, what is really how they're changing the pictures of the report. Then accordingly, sometimes you need to give a, even uh, upfront. We in upfront we also give chemo the uh, uh, stimulant factor. Also, not only the filgastim, uh, sometimes you use the pet filgastim as well yeah. to helping the people. Maybe sometimes in uh, maybe 24 hours before, and sometimes we generally give in generally giving the uh, 24 to 72 hours. In generally, in my practice, mostly using 70 and the 72 hours. 
Uh, not that immediately after 24 hours, no. I in, in generally in my practice, I using this at 72 hours. Uh, so PEC fillers team also use PEC fill grass team, which you can receive available in our country as well. So there's an option. So it is maybe possible. I don't know exactly what they have using, uh, but uh, we can, it may be possible. But some reason also not possible because it's a long chemotherapy, use a chance cycle, another cycle. So it's not use, use, and use. So there's the difficulties. Sometimes very difficult, bone marrow result is limited. So it's not difficult to, uh, sometimes it's also difficulty, but also possible to avoid. Thank you. So thank you very much for your uh, nice uh, discussion about the pancytopenia. It's very dangerous, serious condition for the patient. So I think the, all the um, medical oncologists should have heard this type of uh, complication. Whether I don't know whether uh, it is hundred percent, it is possible to uh, hurt this pancytopenia. I don't know. So uh, every effort should be made to avoid this type of uh, complication of chemotherapy. So next question yes, yes, is: about the, uh, Is there any role of radiotherapy in this case? Because it is diagnosed as the secondary metastasis from the uh, cervix, and it is. Histologically, it is squamous cell carcinoma. So is there any role of radiotherapy in this patient? Yeah, yeah of course. Now, in this is actually very because uh, not only surgical approach also, there is a definitely, definitely there is a role of radiotherapy in cervical cancer. Uh, of course, we have to be, an there's opportunity to use this, uh, radiotherapy in this case, particularly in this case, yeah. If it is, uh, because there's a lots of confusion about the whole case actually, uh, but in but in general I feel if it is squamous cell carcinoma, it's metastasis from the squamous cell carcinoma of cervix. Definitely, there is an opportunity to use radiotherapy, and particularly we can use. And but if you uh, use able to use the IMRT, uh, high tech modality, then it will be better for patient. Thank you very Thank much. You, uh, uh, whether uh, Professor Abraham, are you here? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah. Do you no. want to give some comment about this case? Yeah, it's unfortunate that the uh, cervical growth was missed on the initial evaluation. Yes. And, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, she should have had a radical hysterectomy. Not yes. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, and this uh, the tumor in the ovary. I think in one place it was said squamous, then the second place they said serous. But the immunohistochemistry does not suggest that it is serous because P53 is negative, P16 is positive. So it looks more like a cervical cancer squamous cervical. spread to the ovary. So I think she, I would have not given her. I'm surprised she had nine cycles of chemotherapy. I mean, that's one reason why she developed uh, pancytopenia. She should have radiation. Yes. Thank you very much for your opinion. Uh, our third case will be presented by uh, Dr. Gopa Kundu. Uh, she is a FCPS in both in obstetrics and gynecology, and this, she is also FCPS in gynecological oncology. Dr. Gopa Kundu, are you here? Dr. Gopa Kundu, are you here? Yes. Your screen is not visible. The slide is not visible. Yes. Not Your slide is not visible. Mm -hmm. 
Dia patut tu. Unmute her for now. Go back onto I. Yes. Yes. It is visible. Now it is visible. Thank you, madam. Respected chairperson. Chief guest, distinguished faculty of women abroad, and learned audience. Assalamu alaikum. This glorious December is the month of our 50th Victory Day. First of all, I want to salute all those patriots who sacrifice their lives for the sake of our nation. This is Dr. Gopakundu. On behalf of Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib Medical University, is going to present a case on sex for stomach tumor. Mrs. Selina. Aged 42 years, mother of two living children delivered by cesarean section and one MR, normotensive non-diabetic, regularly menstruating women, admitted at BSMMU on 5th February 2020 with the complaints of amenorrhea for one year, progressive excessive hair growth of her whole body for five years, history of gradual weight gain and occasional lower abdominal pain. With these complaints, she consulted with an endocrinologist. She was advised for ultrasonography of whole abdomen, which revealed a right adnexal mass. Then she was referred to gynecological oncology department, BSMMU, for further management. Regarding menstrual history, she attained her menarche at 13 years of age. Previously, cycle was regular with average flow and duration. She became amenorrheic for last one year. She had no family history of hirsutism and no family history of breast, ovarian, colon, and endometrial carcinoma. On physical examination, positive findings are androgenic alopecia, excessive hair growth of her face, chin, back, both hands, and legs. Ferryman Galloway hirsutism score was 25. There was also acanthosis nigricans and clitoromegaly. Her BMI was 41 kg per meter square. On par abdominal examination, nothing abnormality detected. Per speculum examination, cervix was normal. On bimanual examination, uterus was normal size, antiverted, and mobile. There was a adnex, right adnexal mass, 5 into 5 centimeter, which was solid but mobile. All other furnaces were free. And on pouch of Douglas, there was no deposit. Regarding investigations, all routine investigations will normal, and her serum testosterone re, uh, level was 592.3 nanogram per deciliter. On ultrasonography of whole abdomen, there was a solid hypoechoic mass measuring about 5.6 into 5.1 centimeter in left posterior aspect of uterus, and there was mild to moderate ascites. And CT scan of whole abdomen with pelvis revealed mixed echogenic soft tissue mass measuring about 6.5 into 6.2 into 5 centimeter seen within pelvic cavity appears to arise from right adnexal region. After IV contrast, moderate to strong enhancement of solid component of the mass is noted. Her tumor markers, all tumor markers were normal and serum TSH, free thyroxine, serum LH, FSH, prolactin, estradiol level were normal. Serum dihydroepiandrosterone sulfate uh, was 149.52 microgram per DL, which was normal. 17 hydroxyprogesterone and cortisol level were also normal. Um, on a repeat profile, uh, there was hypertriglyceridemia, uh, which was 668 milligram per DL. She underwent laparotomy on 16 February 2020. On opening the abdomen, there was straw color mild ascitic fluid, which was sent for cytology. There was right ovarian tumor measuring 4 into 5 centimeter, which was red velvety appearance on surface, rubber consistency, free from all surrounding structures. There was no deposit. Left ovary and fallopian tube was normal. So right-sided ovary tumor was done 
and sent for frozen section. But the frozen section report was indeterminate. So decision was taken for total abdominal hysterectomy with left salpingophorectomy, with right salpingectomy, omentectomy with proper surgical staging. The report of ascitic fluid for malignant cell was negative. Histopathology report came lipid cell tumor. Surgical pathological staging was stage 1A. This was the histopathological report, right ovarian tumor, steroid cell tumor with mild nuclear atypia. Her testosterone level returned to normal range six days following removal of tumor. The patient is now on follow-up under endocrinology and gyneo-oncology department and free of any symptoms. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, GOSB, especially Professor Savira Khatun, Madam, for giving me an opportunity to present a case. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gopa Kundu, for your uh, presentation of a very interesting and rare case. And now we have the we have Professor Narzma Hogg as a uh, analyst. She is the head of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology of Dhaka Medical College Hospital. And she is also the treasurer of Gynecological Oncology Society of Bangladesh. And she is doing many cases in gynecological oncology. Now, my question to Professor Nazma Hogg. And she, this patient had the progressive hasitism for five years, last five years. This is a long period she, she was suffering from hirsutism. But uh, whether this patient should have the endocrinological investigation, whether it could be done earlier, and whether she could she have a ultrasonography earlier. Assalamu alaikum and very good evening to all the audience and also the chairperson who is an eminent person in this session, Professor T. H. Sir, and two learned eminent speakers, one from abroad, that is Professor Abraham Pediseli from Muscat and Oman. And another is uh, Professor Syed Akram Hussein, who is a uh, big on oncologist and uh, working in the Square Hospital now. And also to the case presenters and other panelists, and especially thanks to moderator, Professor Sabera Khatun, who selected me as one of the panelists in this session. My question about the progressive hair growth for last five years, whether endocrinological investigation could be done earlier? Yes, obviously. If the endocrinological investigation could earlier, then we, we could, could get an idea about the symptoms, that is hirsutism or androgen producing any uh, symptom, which is not due to PCOD. Because here we see the there is virilization. Another, uh, there is a hormone, that is testosterone is highly high in this case, where the testosterone is high, more than threefold from the normal range, then it is indicative any pathology from the ovary or hormone producing tumor anywhere in the body, not is a physiological condition. So uh, it should be done earlier. And another from the ultrasound of findings, if it is benign, that is PCOD, Hercetism due to PCOD. Here, the ovarian feature, also the adenexal feature, there is a multiple small mm, subcapsular cyst in the ovary. But here we see that there is a solid hypoechoic area in the adenexal, especially behind the uterus. So, if we diagnose this case earlier through the mm, uh, endocrinological investigation, then case should be diagnosed earlier and treatment could be started earlier. And another point, there is a high triglyceride level and ultimately she is suffering from fatty liver. If it can be diagnosed earlier, then 
it can be prevented also. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Professor Nazmaha, for your nice explanation about the about this. Though these cases are very rare, is uh, but uh, this should be kept in mind uh, about these conditions that, that can be happen. Uh, Professor Abraham, are you here? Yes. Yes. Your your presentation was on this topic. This is six for stomach tumor. Uh, can you give any opinion about this case, so that this patient could be diagnosed earlier and managed earlier? And what is the incidence of this type of hormone production, high level of testosterone? Yeah, this is uh, fairly rare. I mean, less than um, probably 0.2 percent. Yes. Of these, mm. uh, sex or ovarian tumors. However, I mean, unfortunately, again, that for five years she was having these uh, virilizations. Virilization. Uh, probably uh, proper examination, ultrasound, imaging would have shown the mass, and then uh, serum testosterone. If it had been done, of course, then the diagnosis would have been clean. She should have had the surgery, I suppose. Anyway, it was delayed, and but uh, finally she had the correct treatment. Correct treatment, yes. Thank you very much. Our last presenter is uh, Dr. Raihana Pedosi. She is the resident fellowship trainee of National Institute of Cancer Research and Hospital, Dhaka. Dr. Raihana Pedosi, are you here? Dr. Raihana? Madam, Assalamu alaikum. Am I audible? Yes, you are visible and audible, but your slide is not visible. Is my slide is audible, visible, ma'am? No, no. The slide is not. This your computer monitor is okay. Presentation the agriculture hobby. Presentation the agriculture hobby. Presentation the agriculture hobby. Yes. Your slide is visible. You can start. Okay. Now for a slide presentation, mood is the hobby. Is it visible now? Yes. Now we can okay. start. Assalamu alaikum. I am Dr. Raihana Pedusi, FCPS trainee, gynecological oncology, National Institute of Cancer Research and Hospital, Dhaka, Bangladesh, is going to present my last case. Mrs. X, 48 years old, mother of two living children, housewife, non-diabetic, normal intensive, was admitted in a private hospital on 4th June 2020 with the complaints of abdominal pain, distension, and vomiting for seven days. Her menstrual history revealed age of menarche at the age of 13 years, menstrual cycle was regular. Age of her last child was 21 years. The couple didn't practice any contraceptive method. There was no family history of breast, ovarian, and colon cancer. On general examination, she was mildly anemic. There was no lymphadenopathy. Examination of breast revealed normal edema absent. On par abdominal examination, there was huge ascites. On per speculum examination, cervix was apparently healthy looking. On bimanual examination, size of the uterus could not be delineated properly. Mass fell through both right and left furnaces. On digital rectal examination, rectal mucosa was free. There was no deposit in pouch of droplets. On investigation, ultrasonogram done on 7th June 2020 that revealed fairly large complex mass, predominantly solid, is seen in right adnexa, which was about 8.2 into 5.5 centimeter, and in left adnexa, which was about 5.4 into 5.3 centimeter. Restless index is less than six, which indicates highly suspicious for malignant. And there was also huge ascites. Uh, here is the adnexal mass on ultrasonogram uh, picture, and here is showing that low resistance flow in the mass. Tumor marker was done on 8th June 2020 that reviews C125, 1950 unit per ml, and C99 and carcinoembryonic antigen were normal. 
Ultrasonogram guided FNSC done on 11th June 2020 that revealed positive for malignancy, suggestive of cyst adenocarcinoma. Then she was advised to take new adjuvant chemotherapy. She received six cycle chemotherapy, paclitaxel plus carboplatin regimen, which was started on 15th June 2020 and completed on 29th September 2020. After completion of new adjuvant chemotherapy, a general examination revealed her performance status was one. She was mildly anemic. There was no lymphadenopathy. Examination of breast revealed normal edema absent. On par abdominal examination, there was no ascites. Par speculum examination revealed service was apparently healthy looking. On bimanual examination, mass fell through both right and left fornices adherent with the uterus. Site of the uterus could not be delineated properly. On digital rectal examination, rectal mucosa was free, pouch of Douglas was free. <laughs> After chemotherapy investigation was done, ultrasonogram of whole abdomen revealed uh, irregular outlined mixed echodenic soft tissue mass measuring about 7.1 into 4.8 centimeter in right adnexa and 3.9 into 3.6 centimeter in left acnesia, and there was no ascites. And after chemotherapy, her CA120 level was 131 unit per ml. Then interval cytoreductive surgery was done outside NICRH on 26th October 2020, and total abdominal hysterectomy with bilateral salpicoprectomy and total omentectomy was done. Paraoperative findings were after opening the peritoneum, there was moderate amount of ascitic fluid. There was bilateral ovarian tumor 7 into 4 cm on right side and 3 into 3 cm on left side, which were mixed in consistency and adjoint with uterus. Otherwise, there was free of adhesion. There was no deposit on cecum ascending colon under surface of diaphragm, right paracolic gutter, left paracolic gutter, descending colon, transverse colon, sigmoid colon, omentum, liver, stomach, and duodenum. There was 2 into 1 cm deposit on pouch of Douglas. This is the paraparty picture of the bilateral ovary tumor. Then the histopathological report revealed bilateral ovaries, metastatic adenocarcinoma, poorly differentiated Kuchenberg tumor. Ovental tissue revealed metastatic adenocarcinoma. So my final diagnosis was metastatic adenocarcinoma of the ovary. Then she attended in NICRH on 11th November 2020 for further management. At that time, she had no complaint. Her general examination revealed normal. On par abdominal examination, and there was a midline incision. Wound was quite unhealthy. Vault was on post of healing. On biomanual examination, there was no mass. And on digital rectal examination, rectal mucosa was free. Then in NICRH histopathology uh, report was reviewed on 9th December 2020, and it revealed metastatic adenocarcinoma of the ovary. And in omentum, there is also metastatic adenocarcinoma. CT scan of whole abdomen also done postoperatively on 21st November 2020, that was also normal. And in upper J endoscopy, there was gastritis. In colonoscopy, there was normal colon, rectum, and anal canal. Finally, tumor board decision was two cycle adjuvant chemotherapy, paclitaxel and carboplatin regimen. Patient started chemotherapy on 21st January 2021 and completed on 20 February 2021. On follow up, patient who came for follow up irregularly till now she had no complaint. Her tumor marker and ultrasonogram revealed normal. Thank you. Thank you uh, for your nice uh, presentation. This is also a very interesting case. Uh, now the question to Professor Shahana to Parveen. Are you here? Shahana, are yes, you madam. here? Yes, madam. Sound to madam. This, this patient is also very interesting and cooking Bhartima, though it is not so real. It is a, a presentation from the presentation of Professor Soed Akram Hussein. We saw that the Kukenberg tumor is the commonest uh, metastatic ovarian cancer. Now, what are the criticism or teaching for the students from this case? Can you criticize or ca can you give some teaching for our students yes. from this yes. case? Yes, madam. Thank you, madam. Assalamualaikum and good evening. As from the very beginning, the patient has the bilateral tumor and predominantly solid mass. But no advance, even after that, no advance imaging was done. The patient has the huge ascites. So 
her gynecologist, the thinking it, it is advanced stage ovarian tumor. And after that, FNC was done, followed by the uh, metastatic and she, her C125 level was elevated and she was in favor of the new adjuvant chemotherapy followed by surgery. But as all we know, the patient has the symptom, she has the vomiting and huge ascites. In that cases, we must have to add because the bilateral ovarian tumor and bilateral, the solid mass, we must have to the, our mind that it may be a Kuchenberg or bilateral. We must have to the, evaluate the primary site, whether it may be metastatic or not. For that reason, primarily, we have to do the upper GI endoscopy, colonoscopy to exclude the primary site, whether it is primary or it is metastatic and the breast examination or advanced imaging and also in advanced imaging because in iota in from the ultrasound finds the iota may suggest the advanced imaging or the referral to the gynae oncologist and the, here the fnc was done and the fnc was in favor of the the um, fnc was favor of the papillary adenocarcinoma probably and in these cases usually as we know in solid cases the fnc the core biopsy is more acceptable than that of the uh, FNSC. So if we do in for proper evaluation is very important in case of the, this type of our bilateral ovarian tumor, proper evaluation for proper evaluation, the advanced imaging that either CT or MRI and for bilateral cases and patients have this vomiting, the upper GI endoscopy, colonoscopy and other primary side could be excluded. After that, we must have to go for the decision. And as because their, her report was the uh, papillary serous carcinoma, in that cases, the, why the patient has received six cycle chemotherapy. If we are in favor of the NSCT followed by surgery, she must have to go for the three cycle chemotherapy, <laughs> then evaluation, whether the patient is responding in this chemotherapy. In spite of that patient received six cycle chemotherapy, and six cycle chemotherapy followed by, but after getting six cycle chemotherapy, I think the response is not so good because only the ascites was the, uh, minimized, there, but, but because after opening her abdomen, there was also ascites and also tumor size was not markedly reduced. And so we must have to evaluate, preoperative evaluation is very important and the bilateral and solid okay. cases, we must have to go for this. Thank and you. Professor Shahana Parveen, and now uh, my question, another question to, I want to hear from you. What is, the, uh, what is your opinion about the endoscopy and colonoscopy findings after the uh, completion of the treatment? She had endoscopy and colonoscopy and it was normal. What is Madam, your opinion? Not only, Madam, not only that, she has the, after his, uh, the surgery, her report was metastatic adenocarcinoma. So we must have to, the, the metastatic, we must have to the exclude the, which was the primary size, at least is the metastatic. So we have to go for the, um, we must have to exclude the, we must have to go for the, um, her, the immunohistochemistry for the searching the primary site and the endoscopy on all cases and always endoscopy cannot exclude the, endo, um, the um, stomach malignancy. So proper hand and expert hand is very important for endoscopic evaluation because patient has the vomiting as because, and not only that, whether this report, how much justified. We have evaluated second time, we have evaluated the histopathology report, but even after that, our ICE is very important. And I think the expert hand endoscopy is very important, but even after that patient had, she's asymptomatic, she has no ascites, probably she has, as far I have heard that she is in follow-up and patient has no complaint and all her marker is normal. So I am in doubt whether it is metastatic or not. Uh, uh, next question to you. Uh, uh, I want to hear from you the, what was the role of uh, surgical oncologist in this case during the surgery? Madam, uh, surgical oncologist during, after opening the abdomen, we must have to, they, as they have shown that they have evaluated the whole, the abdominal cavity. Then not only the abdominal cavity, we must have to evaluate the pancreas and also pancreatic area and also the gallbladder in that case, paraculi gutter. And um, this is very important. And she did everything what they have done. That is six cycle chemotherapy followed by they have done the PSBSO and domentectomy. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, now. Professor Abraham, uh, 
do you want to give some opinion about this case? This is a secondary metastatic ovarian cancer. Uh, I think the final diagnosis is Kukenberg femur, but the there was dilemma about the diagnosis. Yeah, I think, Both uh, before, before the treatment, during the treatment, there was well, dilemma about the diagnosis. Whenever there are bilateral masses which are solid and mobile, you have to think of Krukenberg because you Krukenberg uh, usually there may be ascites and it looks like advanced ovarian cancer, but usually the masses are solid and mobile. Um, and free of addition. And yes. it was free of addition. Yes. And, and so at, many... that, at that time, you know, we have to look for C, the C 125 C ratio and also go in for endoscopies to rule out a, a you know, gastrointestinal primary. Uh, again, I would agree with what uh, Professor Shahana said. Six cycles of chemotherapy is not the uh, usual. Not uh, yes. <laughs> we should have... Yes. I mean, uh, when now, it, more than six cycles, that's when we get into complications of chemotherapy. Yes, yes. Six cycle chemotherapy is not ideal. Uh, yes. Shahana is correct because uh, always we should think, uh, we should evaluate after every cycle of chemotherapy. After first cycle, if it is not possible, after second cycle, we should always evaluate the patient whether this surgery can be done or not. Maximum three, three cycle. It is not ideal to give the six cycle of chemotherapy, new adjuvant chemotherapy. So uh, we should have proper evaluation and proper treatment. Of I want to say, hear from Professor Sohid Akram Hussain something about the this case, because your presentation was on secondary metastatic ovarian cancer. What is your opinion about this case? Unmute. Professor Shana Abraham, uh, our learned colleague, Professor Abraham already say uh, the information actually, we should go, um, my, one thing, one information I can actually, we should be methodical. Everything will go, one is step by step, then we will not miss the things. When I, what are the cases presented I saw today? So things are not being properly go up. So we should go everything step by step. That will be easy for us to identify the things and all informations we should go follow through even maybe books. I think books also good. You have to follow chronologically, then you will not miss anything. Otherwise, you will miss things like that way, and patient will be maltreated, or patient will not be properly treated. So, personally, I feel it uh, doesn't feel good in all cases, actually. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much for your opinion. I think this our case discussion session is uh, over, and uh, I'm very much glad to, to hear the very interesting four cases from our junior colleagues. And I think they have learned a lot from these four cases. And uh, uh, I think all these cases are atypical presentation and atypical treatment. And th there should have some protocol for the treatment, though these tumors are very rare, but we should have some protocol for treatment, for diagnosis and treatment. So thank you very much, all the panelists, for your very interesting, very knowledgeable answer of my questions. Thank you very much. Professor Begum Husniara, Professor Nazma Hawk, Professor Swedakram Hussain, Professor Abraham Piccadilly, Professor Shahana Parvin. All are you very much learned person, and I am very much pleased about the answer given by you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you, Professor Abraham, and thank you. I messaged. Uh, uh, thank okay. you all. This thing. Yes, we are we are running out of time. I am very grateful, audience, for your precious time. We are looking for your cooperation with C initiation in near future too. Thank you for uh, thank, thank you for thank being you. with us. Thank you very much, you. Abraham. Do you want to say something? You no, I think, no, I think these are all learning opportunities. So it's good, like you said, very interesting cases. And uh, I think uh, it would definitely benefit the junior, uh, the fellows. So 
Yes, and like what was emphasized, we have to be methodical and follow a protocol and then we won't make yes. mistakes. Yes. So everybody should have the uh, attempt and should have the very vivid uh, attempt and very thorough thinking about the cases to develop the protocol. I invite mm. all of you, the learned persons, please come together and work together and do the protocol so that these patients are not mismanaged. So thank you for your I want to give thanks to all the speakers, panelists, and case presenters. And I am to Kashifa Arke Wasiki, Amadir Senior Kyo Asen. I am a kid to take the Pachina. I am a kid to take the Pachina. So thank you very much, especially our uh, foreign, uh, panel, uh, foreign speaker, Professor Abraham. I am very much grateful to you every time. We invite you. Your response is very good and very nice and very heartful. So thank you very much. Thank Professor Soida Kramkushin. He is our very you. cooperative with us, with GOSB and other members of the panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hope, hope we will be next month. Next month.